in the 1950s in the South. It was a fearful, fearsome experience. I um, um, was in high school. I wrote a, I was a student journalist. I was honored to be chosen editor of my high school newspaper when I was a junior, first and only person in the 50 year history of that school, whoever was accorded that honor. I held that job for less than two weeks because I wrote an essay submitted it to the daily paper challenging segregation, challenging specific laws that were passed to obstruct black people. And I signed it editor of the Dunbar Chronicle. And my principal, a black man, rather than celebrate my literacy and say, hey, this is great, he almost expelled me from school under pressure from the white power structure. Um, and only in the face of unrelenting public protest did he back down. And my punishment was to be stripped of my editorship. And I still have those articles, and I said, there's still people who, who, who remember. The principal who almost expelled me, he and I really never made peace with each other. Um, um, you know, and I was, I, was, I was a good student. You know, I, I, was a, I, was an, I was an outstanding student. I mean, I was a good student. And, and, and yet, succumbing to pressure that was coming from the power structure downtown, you know, he, he didn't hesitate to do what he, he, he felt he needed to do to keep his job. It's a, it's a terrible, but you know, I have to say, looking back, I don't think that seared me in any way. It may have actually helped to define the career that I pursued because I've essentially spent my whole career uh, working in the field of civil rights and human rights, uh, working uh, to um, fight oppression and to eliminate racism and discrimination where I can find it. Um, I've got classmates who went on to to outstanding corporate careers. They made millions of dollars. Uh, I ain't come close, but I, 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 I feel enriched by that and the fact that it transformed me. And how did it transform me? I was, a, I was a little shy kid who just liked to write. My grandfather gave me a typewriter and I typed. And my aunt was a school teacher and she had a mimeograph machine. And I used to make a little newspaper in my, and, 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 and disseminate it among my peers in my neighborhood. And, to me, I was going on to a career in journalism. I, I, he, he took me, he took that from me. But you know, thankfully, I had teachers who supported me, and I ended up the following spring being elected president of the student body of that school. Something I never aspired, for, I never aspired for, and aspired to. All right. So I think the thing when you look back at the moment, you may not really appreciate. I'm, because I will say that I didn't get physically attacked. Uh, I didn't end up getting expelled from school. It was a threat. It was a real threat. Um, and the, the adults in that community immediately mobilized to say to our principal, this is, this is ridiculous, you're not gonna do this. And, and so uh, he got caught between two forces. And, and he had to do something. All right, and, and he took from me the thing at that moment in time, which was the most important thing to me, to be editor of that newspaper, was something I aspired to. But I didn't let it. I didn't let it. I didn't let it kill me. I didn't let it sap my confidence, and I gained it in other ways. Um, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I that I had the same kind of searing experience that somebody who came face to face with the Ku Klux Klan, somebody whose life was really threatened. But a way of life was being threatened down in Virginia. And it, it eventually, I wrote that piece in 1957, all right? And by the end of the, by the mid-1960s, that society had totally changed down there. It became desegregated. A lot of the resistance to blacks, but fully participating. Uh, that city now has had black mayors, school superintendent is black, black police chief, black fire chief, black corporate heads. It is an entirely different community than the one that I grew up in. And I'd like to think that I, I played some small role 
in, in leading to that transformation by refusing to be suppressed by an act a personal attack on me and then an personal deprivation to rise above it. Equity means the right to fully participate to the limits of your ability. I think when, in my view is this, when a child is born into this world, at that particular moment, they, that child has every right, every uh, um, uh, opportunity. And the problem is that equity stops at that moment. Uh, because we know that children do not grow up to all be equal, to all be on the same footing. There are children who get to the first grade who are behind, who have missed some very significant experiences to essentially develop, to fully develop, develop their potential. So they, they, are, they are held back by, and they haven't really contributed to their own plight. They didn't get the opportunity. They didn't get a chance for preschool. They didn't get a chance for early childhood education, all right? Their neighborhoods were, were poor. They didn't have a chance for uh, a fully nutritional diet. They live in neighborhoods where services are not fully available. And you see that now. And so from that, this plateau of equity where they come into the world, all of a sudden we begin to see the disparities. And there are more, and, there's, and this, these disparities are more defined along class lines. So if you were born, I don't care, I don't, I, in my mind, if you're black, brown, uh, or, what, or, or white, um, if you are born into a circumstances where privileges are abundant, all right, then you're gonna develop in a different way. And as a society, we have not yet figured out a way to smooth out this path to ensure that as people progress along the way, they continue to hold on to all of those privileges that will empower them when they grow old. And most people are, will say, I believe in equal opportunity. I believe that you have the equal right to pursue these things. But the question is whether you have the ability and the tools. And President Johnson used this analogy of two people at a track meet at the starting line. And one of those people had their ankles bound. The other one was completely unfettered. The starting gun uh, was fired and off the two runners started. Well, obviously, one of them was hobbled. The other one was able to sprint far ahead. So President Johnson said, now about halfway around the track, you stop. You stop the race. You take the shackles off of the second runner. One runner's up here, the other's back here. You take the shackles off and you start the race again. And he says, clearly, the person who got the head start, the one who was unshackled and got the head start, is gonna win that race. The only way you can bring that other person is to take him or her where they are stopped and bring them up halfway to the halfway line. Take the shackles off and start the race again. And what he said is, we've got to be prepared to make the investments to take the shackles off the people who have been restricted and inhibited for, for two or three hundred years. And we've got to bring them back from where they are in the back up to the front line and start the race again and now see what results you get. Well, clearly, one of them is going to win and one is going to lose, but the question is by how, what's the distance? And if that runner can close that gap to the point where he or she can almost win, now you're talking about equal opportunity, true equal opportunity. But in most people's minds, they say, oh, I'm opposed to that, because now you're talking about equal results. You're trying to say everybody's got to finish it. How do you have equal opportunity if you don't put any focus on results? 
And, that's what, and that was what affirmative action was all about. Trying to say, let us equip people who have been historically deprived, give them the access and the resources so that they at least have a chance to win the game. And most say, oh, but you're giving those people an unfair advantage. No, they've had an unfair, they had an unfair disadvantage for centuries. And now we're trying to even the path. If I had the answer to that, I'd be a billionaire. Um, because we're talking about human nature and we're talking about human behavior. And um, people can relate to a fact or to an issue, in my experience, until it hits home, until they, their interests become affected. How do we, I used to have some hope that this was a generational thing and as people of my generation began to die out and our children came behind us, that they would even out the path. And, and, and I, I, I think that was true, and I think to some extent that's still true. The whole key is not to put people together who think alike so they can just pat each other on the back, but you have to have the hard, difficult discussions.